The story of life on Earth is, without a doubt, one of the best stories ever told. For the past few billion years, life has endured. And for the past 500 million years, complex life forms have ruled the world. And throughout complex life story, there have been five big bottlenecks that have hindered its progress. These are the five mass extinction events. Welcome back everyone to The Great Dyings, a five-part video series on the five mass extinctions. Last time we explored the most deadly extinction event in the history of life, the Permian-Triassic mass extinction that ended the Paleozoic era and began the Mesozoic with the Triassic period. Today we will be exploring the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction, which ended the Triassic on the Triassic-Jurassic border. While it is a relatively unknown extinction, the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction is incredibly significant since it paved the way for the age of the dinosaurs. However, the Triassic period itself is a very interesting time during Earth's history. And I know I said that for every period we've explored in the series, but trust me when I say that the Triassic is definitely the most bizarre period that we will explore in this entire series. So anyways, before we explore the Triassic mass extinction, we must first explore the world it took place in. The Triassic period is the seventh period of the Phanerozoic Eon and the first period of the Mesozoic Era. It began around 252 million years ago and ended around 201 million years ago. It was preceded by the Permian period and followed by the Jurassic period. Sadly, despite its uniqueness, the Triassic is often overshadowed by the other periods of the Mesozoic Era, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods. Many things about the Triassic are very interesting, but perhaps the most interesting component is the life that lived at the time. However, in order to understand life in the Triassic, we must first have a good understanding of the climate and geography. The preceding Permian-Triassic mass extinction had really taken its toll on the climate of the world, and these effects would be felt well into the Triassic. For the majority of the Triassic, the climate on land was very hot and dry, reaching temperatures ranging from 50 to 60 degrees Celsius or 122 to 140 Fahrenheit. The seas were slightly cooler, reaching around 40 degrees Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit. The land was mostly dominated by harsh deserts. This was in part because at the time, all of the land masses on Earth were joined together into one big supercontinent called Pangaea. This prevented rainwater from reaching the center of the supercontinent. Almost entirely encircled by eastern Pangaea were the Paleotethys and Tethys oceans. Meanwhile, the remainder of the globe was covered in an all-too-familiar body of water, the Panthalassic Ocean. When the Triassic began, the world was just barely beginning to recover from the most deadly extinction event in the history of life, which, as I briefly explained in the previous video, played a big role in the bizarre evolutionary achievements that took place during the Triassic. With a good 90% of all life extinct, many ecological niches were left open, and the few who remained would evolve to fill these niches. As a result, evolution would run wild during the Triassic, creating some of the most bizarre life forms in the fossil record. The few marine species that squeezed through the Permian-Triassic border, such as the conodonts, ammonites, sea urchins, and rayfin fish, would go on to diversify across the early Triassic. During this time, the first true corals as we know them today would also evolve. Many familiar species such as gastropods, bivalves, and brachiopods roamed the seafloor. One of the most significant marine animals to evolve at this time was a group of marine reptiles known as the ichthyosaurs. The largest of these reptiles was the Shastosaurus, which are thought to have possibly reached lengths of 21 meters or 69 feet. The Triassic marked the beginning of an age of marine reptiles that would endure for the next 170 million years until the end of the Mesozoic. One of the most bizarre animals to live during the Triassic was one of these marine reptiles. Adipodentatus reached lengths of around 2.7 meters, or 9 feet, and appeared during the early Triassic. It is most well known for its more than unique jaw, which appeared to be shaped almost in a hammerhead-like manner. It would use this goofy mouth for eating aquatic plants. Another weird semi-aquatic reptile from the early Triassic is the Tanistrophius, which is probably one of my favorite prehistoric animals of all time. This animal reached around a length of 6 meters or 20 feet. However, its ridiculously long neck made up over half of its body length at around 3 meters or 10 feet long. Other than that, though, 
there aren't really any major things we need to touch on in the seas of the Triassic. So now we move on to life on land, where things start to get even more interesting. Life on land is really where the evidence of this surge in evolution can be found. A new group of animals called the Archosaurs had evolved by the early Triassic and would go on to dominate the terrestrial world. At the time, one of the most successful clades of Archosaurs was the Erythrosuchidae, the most famous of which was the apex predator Erythrosuchus, whose meter-long jaw accounted for almost 20% of its body length. Probably the most dominant Archosaurs at the time, though, were the Pseudosuchians, a group of large crocodile-like carnivores such as Postosuchus and Sarcosuchus. For the majority of the Triassic, the Pseudosuchians were the apex predators. Towards the middle of the Triassic, another group of archosaur morphs would appear, and that they were somewhat insignificant at the time, they would go on to rule the world once their competition was wiped out. These, of course, were the first dinosaurs, such as Eoraptor and Coelophysis, whose resourcefulness and adaptability allowed them to survive the trials of the Pangean Plains. Alongside them appeared the Pterosaurs, another group of archosaurs that would go on to rule the skies. One of the most important non-archosaur morphs to live during this time were the Cynodonts. They were a group of synapsids that had survived the Permian extinction and were the underdogs of their time. These are the ancestors of the first mammals, and it is thanks to them that the world is the way we know it today. Life was going incredibly well in the wake of such devastation, but it was never prepared for what happened next. Now, I want to make it known that I am really glossing over things when it comes to covering the Triassic wildlife. There is so much more to what I briefly covered, and we've only touched the tip of the iceberg. But since the focus on this video is supposed to be on the Triassic mass extinction and not the period itself, I thought it would be kind of weird if the video chapter on Triassic life was longer than the one on the extinction. The Triassic is a very interesting period, though, and definitely deserves its own video someday. But anyways, let's move on to the next section. The Triassic ended very much the same way it began, with the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction. And just like most mass extinctions, we don't know for sure what caused it. It occurred during the final few million years of the Triassic, though there is some evidence to suggest that the extinction would have begun over 18 million years before the end of the period. There are many theories about the cause of this devastation, but a more likely possibility is that many causes came together to form the extinction. The end Triassic extinction had a very interesting effect on Triassic life, but before we explore these effects and the feature they caused, we must first explore the possible causes for the extinction. Similar to many other extinction events, some scientists consider the possibility that an asteroid may have struck Earth similar to the one at the end of the Mesozoic. There is some evidence to support this, as an impact crater that has been discovered in Quebec, Canada. This crater is one of the biggest impact craters from the Mesozoic, only second to the one that killed the dinosaurs. However, the asteroid that caused it wouldn't have been even close to big enough to cause an extinction on the scale of the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction. Many smaller collisions have also been found and connected to the end of the Triassic, so a likely possibility is that these many asteroid collisions did still contribute to the extinction by fueling other causes. Overall, the asteroid collision on its own is a very unlikely cause for this extinction event. Another theory states that gradual climate change may have been responsible for the end Triassic mass extinction. The hot climate would have continued to increase, causing arid and dry conditions. An increase in evaporite and carbonate deposits from this time period supports this theory, as they are deposits which are most abundant in dry climates. Changing sea levels and increased ocean acidification may have also played a role in affecting marine life. Also, geological processes may have affected the diversity of land biomes, causing a challenge for the unique wildlife that had evolved to fit these unique environments. The impact that these changes may have had on Triassic life is not very clear to us, and it is very possible that they were not nearly as deadly as we first expected. Now, as we have already established with the other causes, it is more likely that this cause, combined with other factors, resulted in the extinction. Regardless of how many causes there were, however, there is one possibility that is considered to be the main and most probable cause of the extinction. The leading theory for the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction event is an increase in large volcanic eruptions caused by the tectonic processes of Pangaea. 
similar to the causes of the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. Many of these eruptions would have taken place in the central Atlantic magmatic province, or CAMP. We know this because within this province lies an 11 million square kilometer, or 4.2 million square mile, blanket of igneous rock, which covers much of southeastern North America, northeastern South America, northwestern Africa, and southwestern Europe. It is one of the biggest igneous rock provinces known to us today. In fact, it may have been even bigger than we thought, since erosion has seemed to have weathered away much of the province. Anyways, these volcanic eruptions were caused by the beginning of the expansion of the Atlantic Ocean. These massive volcanic eruptions could have lasted anywhere from 20,000 to 40,000 years, and would have been detrimental to the Triassic environment. These eruptions would have caused rapid global warming, Temperatures across the Triassic world increased by 3 to 4 degrees Celsius worldwide. There is even some evidence to suggest that some regions might have experienced temperature increases of over 10 degrees Celsius. The increased temperatures would have pushed the already struggling terrestrial ecosystem to its limits. The sea life would also experience challenges as the CO2 and other volcanic gases raised pH levels in the waters, causing the oceans to become acidic. Along with the extinction of many ocean vertebrates, this would have led to the bleaching of coral reefs, and thus the extinction of many corals and the creatures that relied on them. This uptick in CO2 levels would have also caused the oceans to become stagnant, as most of the gas went unabsorbed, causing marine anoxia. Meanwhile, life on land was still really struggling. While the volcanic gases may have caused long-term global warming, gases such as sulfur dioxide may have been responsible for a short-term global cooling. These conditions would have favored the endothermic animals of the time, thus leading to the extinction of many exothermic species. These eruptions may have also released a lot of toxic mercury, which would have subjected animals to mercury poisoning. Finally, the intense global warming may have caused an increase in lightning storms, which combined with the hot and dry climates would have caused extensive wildfires across the globe. All of these consequences of the camp eruptions, combined with the possibility of asteroid strikes, and gradual climate change beforehand ultimately came together in the end to cause the Triassic mass extinction event. The Triassic-Jurassic extinction, despite being relatively unknown, holds a lot of significance as a chapter in the story of life. This is because of the impact it had on the life of the Triassic and the world that would result from it. The extinction killed off almost all archosauromorphs other than the dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodilomorphs. Also, it saw a large decrease in the population of ammonites. However, ammonite numbers had already been declining before the extinction, so it didn't take long for them to readapt and get back on track. The extinction also saw the complete eradication of the conodonts, the eel-like creatures known for their bizarre feeding apparatus that had been with us since the Cambrian and Ordovician periods. Overall, the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction event took a heavy toll on the Triassic world, with around 20 to 23 percent of all taxonomic families and 48 percent of all genera disappearing, and around 70 to 76 percent of all life on Earth being wiped out. Despite the tragic nature of this event, it is the least deadly of the Big Five mass extinctions. The ending of the Triassic and the beginning of the Jurassic marked a very significant moment in the history of the Earth as it was the beginning of a time of peace and stability. A true peaceful Earth, unaffected by climate change, volcanoes, and other terrible events for almost 135 million years. This peacetime began with the rise of a new breed of animals, one which had only evolved a few million years earlier during the turmoils of the Triassic, and was possessive of a very important trait, adaptability. I'm of course talking about the dinosaurs, who, after surviving this extinction, would go on to be the rulers of this age of peace, or rather, this age of dinosaurs. There are many theories as to how dinosaurs survived the Triassic extinction, but one theory is that they may have evolved to be endothermic, or to have feathers. This would have allowed them to retreat up or down into poles during the intense global warming, and would have also helped them endure the brief global cooling. The same theories are held for the survival of pterosaurs and crocodilians, who would go on to rule alongside the dinosaurs during the Age of Peace. So that's probably how dinosaurs survived the bottleneck of the end of the Triassic. But how exactly did they take over the world? 
Well, if you've been following the series or know your fair share about mass extinctions, then you know the effects that they can have on the biodiversity of the world afterward. With the majority of their neighbors wiped out, the survivors are left to fill the empty ecological niches left behind. The same happened with the dinosaurs. Since they were so diverse and adaptable, they quickly took up many of the niches left behind by the other extinct archosaurs before anybody else could get there. This left many non-dinosaur creatures, such as mammals, to walk in their shadows for the rest of the Mesozoic, since they left barely any dominant niches for the other clades to fill. Marine reptiles such as Plesiosaurus and Ichthyosaurus survived the extinction and would go on to rule the seas during the remainder of the Mesozoic. Meanwhile, the pterosaurs would continue to take to the skies, and during their reign would develop into some of the largest flying animals that ever exist, such as Quetzalcoatlus and Hatzegopteryx. Life was good and peaceful for the inhabitants of the Jurassic and Cretaceous globe for almost 135 million years as the dinosaurs roamed the Earth. But then something happened. Just by chance, after over 100 million years of peace, the entire future of the Earth was changed in a mere instant. But more on that next time. So there you have it. That is the story of the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction event the extinction which was eerily similar to the one that occurred only 50 million years before it, which paved the way for the rise of the dinosaurs. Next time on The Great Dyings, we will be exploring the Cretaceous Paleogene, or KPG mass extinction event, also known as the day that the dinosaurs died. But until then, thanks for watching.